Bible Seminary's Chapel Podcast. When my wife and I left uh, Dallas Seminary to head to Raleigh to uh, plant this church, uh, we drove away in, a, in an old F-150 pickup truck. That's, that was what we had because her daddy had given it to us. He worked in the Ford assembly plant for many decades, and we didn't own a car here as students, and so he thought we needed something, so he gave us that. It was just barely above something, but it did work. No air, uh, nothing power. We could squeeze the twins in the middle, and she'd hug the door, and I'd get behind the wheel, and somehow we did it. If social services saw it today, they'd arrest us probably, but at any rate, that's what we went there with. And and I've been in trucks, I don't know why, I'm really not a truck kind of guy, but that uh, lasted for about 10 years, and then a man in the church uh, gave me an old truck that he had, and, and uh, an old Chevy, so I drove that for about five years, and then it, it went the way of all flesh and, and metal and, and died, and then another man gave me uh, his old pickup truck and uh, had 140,000 miles on it, but you never look a gift truck in the radiator. That's my motto. <laughs> so I took it, drove it to 220,000 miles, and this past summer it died. And the church, we celebrated our 20th anniversary, and the church, I guess they were embarrassed. They never wanted to see me in one of those again. They bought me a brand new F-150 Ford pickup truck with everything on it. <laughs> Is God good or what? <laughs> I thought I'm going to get a license. I'm going to get one of those vanity plates. You know, I scoff at people with those vanity plates. Well, I was. I wanted to have, and I wanted to have Shepherd. I thought that'd be the neatest thing to be a pastor and have a pickup truck and have the license say Shepherd. That'd just be the okay for me. That'd be the coolest thing to have. <laughs> Obviously, nobody's on my side. So I went down to the Division of Motor Vehicles, and I, uh, I went up, stood in line, finally got up there, and that lady, of course, didn't want to be there, and she'd been there all day. And I said, I'm a pastor in town, and I, I would like to get one of those plates, and, and I'd like it to say shepherd. And she just kind of looked at me, and, and I said, well, let me, let me just spell it uh, for you. And I... <laughs> I, I, I spelled shepherd. She typed it in, and she looked at me, and she said, I'm sorry, somebody else has it. I thought there's another pastor in North Carolina that took my idea first, okay? And he's got shepherd. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I knew I'd worked up the nerve. I was going to spend the 15 bucks to get that. And, and I thought, well, and I said, I'll bet you nobody has it in Greek. <laughs> she just looked at me, and I said, I said type this in. P-O-I-M-E-N-A-S, plural for shepherds, Ephesians 4.11. She typed it in, looked up at me, she said, well, what do you know? Nobody has it. <laughs> so I got poimenos. I, nobody knows what it means, but I do. <laughs> I, I, I went home, and this is true, I'm telling you the truth. I went home and told my wife, honey, they, somebody had shepherd, but I got it in Greek. And without... Batting an eye, she said, honey, with the way you drive, I'm glad it's in Greek. <laughs> about a month ago, about a month ago, I, I couldn't quite figure out why I had gotten a sheet of paper with pictures of my F-150 in the mail, three of them. My beloved town, the city that had put up those radar, you know, engineered cameras at certain intersections, one right near our church, which is not of God, <laughs> had taken pictures of me. I'd been caught on film. There was one picture of me in the left-hand lane with the light clearly shown as red, a second picture of me in the intersection, and I have taken pride that I have never run a red light. They're always yellow, and they're never red. There it is, red, and I'm in the middle of the intersection. And then the third one, close up of my license plate. Poimenos, right there. F-150, Poimenos, it was me. It was 
undisputable, it was undeniable, they had caught me violating that red light. The only positive thing, by the way, about those pictures is it was proof that that truck looks so good. <laughs> At the bottom of the notice, it said, if you want to avoid any further civil action, send us $50. So obviously, I wrote out a check and sent him $50. No need to argue, no need to bother. Although I did read a few, week, uh, few months earlier about a guy who thought he'd be a wise guy. He had gotten one of those notices in the mail picture of his car running a red light, and uh, he was told to send in $40, and so he thought he'd be a smart aleck, and so he he sent in a photograph of $40. (laughs) Two $20 bills, took a photograph. (laughs) About a week later, he got another letter back from the town. This time, it included a photograph of of handcuffs. So I had read that before I got my notice, so I wasn't going to be a wise guy. But I've got to tell you, it was really odd. It was really strange to see pictures of me breaking the law. It was actually very embarrassing to have my actions recorded on camera made me think, what if someone was tailing me all day long, taking snapshots at different occasions, and then sending me the photographs? Well, what if, what if the, the divine cameraman followed all of us around, and at, at certain places, certain intersections of events, and details and schedules snap. There you are, close up, and your words captioned underneath. Would we be surprised by what those pictures revealed? Would those photographs record any action that looked or sounded like love? The Apostle Paul, it's as if he's been roaming through the neighborhood and the churches of his era taking pictures, and he delivers the pictures to us in this envelope marked 1 Corinthians 13. And he shows us with these photographs what love looks like. This is indisputable evidence of love caught. Now, our translation indicates that these are adjectives, as you probably know they are not. They are verbs, all 15 of them. This is love in action. This isn't something, Garland writes in his exegetical commentary, that you feel. It isn't some inner sensation or emotion. In fact, this kind of love isn't really conveyed by words alone. It has to be shown. It can be defined only by what it does and does not do. He's going to show us love caught on film. Undeniable evidence of what true love looks like in action. First phrase of verse 4 where we pick up our study is, is two positive statements or verbs. Love is patient. Love is kind. The first of 15 verbs Uh, These are two positive ones followed rather quickly with about eight negative uh, verbs or phrases which could be translated in the negative uh, sense or a dark and, and dismal sense. These first two descriptions are nothing less than two surprising snapshots of love because of where they would show up. And they had the list here. But as you understand them, you you discover that they show up in surprising places. The first one that we'll just translate to get the sense of this action verb is this. Love exercises patience. Macrothumeo is the word long-suffering macro, which we use in our English language often. Long, broad, as opposed to micro, tiny, small. Thumeo refers to passion. It is used of something, Reinecker says, breaking into 
flames. In other words, macrothumeo literally means taking a long time to burst into flame. Often it's translated long suffering. This is a long fused love. And by the way, this word chosen by the Spirit of God, this verb has to do with patience with people, not things. Primarily, this particular verb relates to people. It's one thing to exercise patience over that photocopy machine that continues to jam, right? It's another thing to exercise patience over a lawnmower that won't start or a car that won't start in the morning or a tire that goes flat or, or maybe that vending machine. You put in your 75 cents and that candy bar, and then it stops and it won't fall. And so what do you do? You kind of hit the glass and you shake it and you kick it, you threaten it, all sorts of things, and then you finally walk away. That's not the word here. This has to do with exercising patience with people, people that you might want to shake, people that you might want to threaten, people that don't deliver, people that are irritating. At that moment, when you encounter that and that scene develops, the snapshot is taken, and what do we look like? Do we demonstrate this evidence of true love? And the first one in the list, it's just interesting to me, the first one is love toward the irritating, the unloving. The Pharisees in the days of Paul had this wonderful theory of compensation, that is, you return to others whatever they gave to you. That's why the teaching of Christ through Paul is so radical. It was, it was no longer an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, which is certainly the basis for justice and, and, and just remuneration. But now it's self-defacing. Now it's self-defrauding. Now it's self-emptying. He writes to the same uh, church, you need to be willing, should you be taken by another believer, instead of going to court, let them have everything you've got. Self-emptying, self-defrauding love. How unlike the world which lives by the opposite motto, don't, don't get mad. Get what? Even. Get even. Do unto others before they do unto you. That's the law of the jungle out there. Jesus Christ says, here's a new motto, Endure suffering without seeking retaliation. Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 17, do not repay evil with evil. Chrysostom, the church leader, said that this particular word, makrothumeo, describes a man who has been wronged and has the power to avenge himself, and he walks away. The Greeks of Paul's day would have considered makrothumeo a sign of weakness. We know it's a sign of supernatural strength, don't we? In fact, it's the only way you can demonstrate uh, this is, is to not even try to drum it up, not even try to come up with it on your own, but to surrender to the Spirit of God who develops it in your life as one of His fruits, for the fruit of the Spirit is patience. This is true strength. One of the remarkable Historical examples of this kind of strength is Abraham Lincoln, and perhaps you've read a biography or two. I've read several of his life. You come across, if you read his biography, is the bitter resentment that was evidenced toward him by Edward Stanton, who just couldn't stand him. He just hated him for some reason. Stanton called Lincoln a clown. To the press, he nicknamed Lincoln the original gorilla. In fact, he said on one particular, of one particular explorer that he was a fool to take hunting expeditions trying to capture a wild gorilla when he could have found one so easily at Springfield, Illinois. Lincoln said nothing. In fact, later on when Lincoln became president of the United States, he chose Edward Stanton to become his, Edwin Stanton to be his secretary of war. And friends and colleagues Asked him, are you out of your mind? Why would you do that? And Lincoln calmly responded, he's the best man for the job. The years wore on and the night came, of course, when the assassin's bullet murdered Lincoln in Ford's theater and he was rushed across the street to a little home where he lay and eventually died. And 
It wasn't long before Edwin Stanton stood in that home looking down at Lincoln's silent face, and he said through his tears those now immortal words, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. The patience of love had conquered in the end. See, this is to love those who are most needy and the most irritating among you. Paul writes to the Thessalonians using the same word for patience. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, that is the disorderly. Encourage the faint-hearted, that is those who are prone to worry and discouragement. Help the weak. In that context, it refers to the morally unstable, that you have to constantly reinforce purity. Then Paul closes by saying or adding, and be patient with all of them. Be long fused with them all. Anybody can love the lovable. Anybody can exercise patience with the considerate. Anybody can put up with the orderly and the neat and the strong and the refined and the polite. This is not the patience of agape. The photograph of this kind of agape catches us when we exercise patience toward those that we'd rather not exercise patience toward. One author said that macrothumeo is having patience to bear with those who resist change. You're going to pastor them one day. Those who are weak in their faith, you're going to lead them one day. Those who are quick to complain, you're going to be on a board with them one day. Those who are forgetful of their responsibilities and are emotionally unstable, you are going to counsel them. You are going to teach them one day. Paul says, be long at bursting into flame with them all. This is love in action. Kittle records, the ancient Greeks used this word patience for the physician who continued to treat a chronic illness when there was no hope for a cure. Why treat him? Why bother? Why go through the sweat of it all? Because the patient has inerrant worth and value, therefore you have chosen to serve him even though the outlook is bleak and there are no guarantees. This is the agape of God in that even though we were sinners, how hopeless were we? Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. This is true, genuine, God-like, Christ-imitating, sacrificial, and might I add, surprising love that is patient toward the irritable, the unexpressive, the disappointment, the disappointing of the unlovely. I wonder, have you been caught in a photograph demonstrating this kind of love? Agape doesn't stop there. He adds the next action verb. Love not only demonstrates patience, love is, love is kind. It expresses kindness. Being kind is the counterpart of being patient. In other words, while patience will put up with anything, kindness will give away anything. It's one thing to be, to be patient with somebody and, and not really be that loving, right? Just avoid that person. Never come in contact with them. You can be very patient with them. It's possible to be patient and not kind. I heard a story some time ago, and it's always dangerous to tell stories, you know, like these, because you have speakers every week. Um, but I'll take a chance here. Um, this, this guy wanted to, wanted to meet an Amish couple that he saw. My, my boys are in Pennsylvania, and there are a lot of Amish people. Anybody here from Pennsylvania? Beautiful country, Lancaster County. And so he saw, leaving a store, an Amish, an old Amish couple heading toward their little cart. And he ran over to them and he said, you know, I've always wanted to meet an Amish couple. Do you have just a few minutes? I'd just like to meet you. And the man's wife, hard of hearing, ribbed her husband and said, what's he saying? 
And the man looked at her and he said, he just wants to meet us. The young man said, do you have, do you have children? And the man said, oh yes, we have 37 children and 63 grandchildren. And the wife ribbed him. What's he saying now? He wants to know if we have children, he said. The young man said, uh, you live around here, I'm sure. You lived here long. Oh, yes, my family's had a farm for four generations. And the woman again ribbed her husband. What's he saying now? Well, he wants to know if we live around here, and we do. Finally, the young man, he needed to let them go. He said, you know, I, I just have to tell you, I dated an Amish girl one time in college. Amazing. I, I'm from around here, too. And, but she was kind of bossy and never let me think for myself and always told me what to do. And about that time, the woman ribbed her husband. What's he saying now? And the man looked at his wife and said, he thinks he knows you. <laughs> you know, the women are all going, huh? <laughs> See, it's possible to be very patient, calm, and be unkind. In the ministry, you can learn how to do it as an art. You can keep your voice low and calm, and you can cut somebody's head off and smile at the same time. And people will say he's so patient, but unkind. So it's interesting to me that, that Paul will couple this, these verbs together. In fact, they're found often together. This word means that we not only take the injury from someone with patience, but we return the injury with kindness. Agape is not for the weak of heart. This is Jesus Christ telling his disciples to love their enemies. He did not simply mean that they were to feel kindly about them, but to literally be kind to them. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. Same word, Romans 2, 4. Peter writes, uh, we have all tasted the kindness of our Lord. 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, same word. We're being called to demonstrate the kindness toward the world that God has demonstrated toward us. You remember Paul's injunction in Romans chapter 12, verse 20, to feed your enemy when he's hungry, and if he's thirsty, give him a drink, and in so doing, you will heap burning coals of fire on his head. And you say, I like that burning coal part. I can do that. Paul is taking something from his culture that we wouldn't immediately understand. Of course, nobody had matches in the pantry back then. You lose your coals, they smolder out. Maybe you're sick, so sick that you can't crawl over to the fire. Or maybe it goes out. You've been away. You can't eat. You aren't warm. It was dangerous. So you just went to your neighbor, and in the custom of that era, you would take your little basin, as you've probably seen them if you've been overseas, you'd balance it on your head, and you'd go over to your neighbor, and he'd ask for coals. Now, if your neighbor wasn't very kind, he might say begrudgingly, oh, well, I'll give you two or three. And if your neighbor lived any distance away, by the time you got back to your hut, the coals had lost their fire. But if he would be kind, he would heap burning coals on your head in your basin so that when you got back to your hut, you could immediately cook. You could immediately be warned. Now, you could do that for a friend. Here, let me give you a heaping pile of coals. Or maybe somebody you don't know, but your enemy shows up, someone who hates you. Would you give him one or two? Would you give him any at all? This is that kind of person of whom Christ is speaking. If you want to demonstrate the love of God, the agape love of kindness, then demonstrate self-denial, selfless, supportive love for someone you either don't know or someone who might even hate you. Demonstrate kindness like that. Have you ever had your picture taken lately doing something like that? The world is to this day amazed at any demonstration of agape. World Magazine, which I subscribe to, carried in their spring edition 2006 an article uh, written by an atheist. He was absolutely depressed because of the, the, the loving actions of Christians relative to crises that were occurring 
around the globe. He'd watched uh, faith-based ministries respond to Hurricane Katrina. He lamented in a newspaper column, and I quote him, notable by our absence were teams from rationalist societies, free thinkers clubs, and atheists associations, the sort of people who scoff at religion's intellectual absurdity. According to Hattersley, this author, he said, it was an obvious conclusion, and I quote him, that Christians are the most likely to take the risks and make the sacrifices involved in helping other people. He went on to say that drug addiction offends Christians, but they are the most willing ones to change fetid bandages and clean the addicts up. Listen to his conclusion. He said, the only possible conclusion is that Christians have moral imperatives that make them morally superior to atheists like me. In the second century, you take it all the way back there, the pagans were so struck by the kindness of the Christians toward people who rejected them. Tertullian recorded on one occasion that Christians were often nicknamed by the changing of one Greek letter from Christiani, followers of Christ, to Christiani, made up of kindness. Do we surprise anybody today by this kind of love? There are two reasons why there aren't more of us in more photographs that reveal patience and kindness. There are two demands. Number one, Neither patience nor kindness can be developed apart from the Spirit. And I'm not sure I've done a very good job of saying this this week thus far, so I want to just stop and make sure I clearly state it. Even though it's obvious, let's, let's get it out there. Agape is impossible. We are reading, we are studying something that is impossible. It is not natural. It is against our nature. It is not who we are. The only way we could ever demonstrate patience or kindness is to understand it is the fruit of the Spirit of God. They are coupled together again in that text. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, these same two words. You cannot decide in Chafer Chapel that you are going to muster up the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to decide when I go out there, I'm going to exercise patience and kindness. I'm going to make up, you know, I'm going to come up with it. I'm going to do better. No. What you do is surrender to the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God infuses this into our character and our spirit born nature. These are the results of surrender to the Spirit of God. So as you're driving toward that congregational meeting that you know is going to be really tough, you surrender to the Spirit of God. As you enter that scene in the classroom, dormitory, that ministry assignment, and you know it's going to be challenging, you Surrender to the Spirit of God. You don't stand outside the door and go, okay, feel, feel patient, feel patient, feel patient, feel patient. Feel patient. No. You pursue Him. And patience and kindness eventually find their way into your photo album. Secondly, neither patience nor kindness can be demonstrated apart from suffering. These two verbs require difficulty. Patience requires what? Irritating people to be exercised. That's why when you pray to God, Lord, I really would like to develop patience, what does he do? He gives you your roommate, <laughs> right? He gives you that boss, that fellow employee, that colleague. What are you doing, Lord? I'm answering your prayer because the agape of this type requires challenge and difficulty in order to be exercised. Kindness demands unloving conditions to be practiced. While patience demands irritating conditions, kindness demands unloving 
conditions. You do not exercise patience or kindness then in private. You have to go public. And not just any kind of public. Lenski wrote, these two actions are not revealed in surroundings of friendship and affection where each individual embraces and kisses the other. This is action in a bad, self-centered world. Maybe that's why these pictures are so rare and far too rare in our own lives to be excused. I want to wrap it up by reading to you something that I read several years ago about a group of people who demonstrated kindness in a rare way, and the world even took note, and I'm not sure how many believers were involved, but I'm sure there were some, but this was just a company that did this. In 1975, a child named Raymond Dunn was born in New York. The Associated Press reported that at his birth, a skull fracture and oxygen deprivation caused severe retardation. As Raymond grew, the family discovered further impairments. His twisted body uh, had suffered up to 20 seizures a day. He was found to be blind, mute, and virtually immobile. He had severe allergies that limited him to only one food that was found after numerous, numerous attempts to find something he could digest. It was a meat-based formula made by Gerber Foods. But in 1985, Gerber stopped making the formula that Raymond thrived on. His mother, Carolyn Dunn, scoured the countryside to buy what stores still had in stock, accumulating just cases and cases of it. But by 1990, her supply was running out. In desperation, she appealed to Gerber for help. Would they help her and her son? The employees of the company were told the news. They not only listened, But they responded in an unprecedented action. Volunteers donated hundreds of hours to bring out old equipment, set up a production line, obtained special approval from the USDA, and produced the formula all for one boy. In January of 1995, Raymond Dunn, who'd become known as the Gerber boy, passed away. But during his brief lifetime, he had called forth, this journalist wrote, a surprising kindness and care. It's a surprising picture, isn't it? Could we, the people of God, be any less? Paul says, let me show you a more excellent way to live. By the way, he isn't giving here in this text Corinthians or Texans or Carolinians a different way to feel. He's giving us a different way to live, a radically different way to live. And so we surrender to the Spirit and we invite suffering so that we can demonstrate to our watching world who, by the way, has cameras loaded and ready. They're ready. Let's show them the patience of agape and the kindness of agape, which become irrefutable, undeniable, uncontestable pictures of true love. Father, thank you for these descriptive verbs. Thank you for the testimony of your own ministry. Thank you for the challenge to us as believers. to parishioners, to leaders alike. It's so easy for us to say we love you, and it's easy to say we love each other. Would you, by your Spirit and our surrender to your Spirit, allow us to demonstrate patience and kindness today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.